You guys wanted to see a video on page objects, so I guess I could better go clean my room. Page objects for test automation are nothing fancy. They're a method of organization. Take this room, for example. There's a lot going on. Imagine we want to separate this room into an app. If our app needs to be tested, we have multiple things going on here. The test could look like an awfully big mess, just like the room. One way we can clean this up would be to use page objects. Each page is handling separate functionality for the app. This allows us to reuse these pages in multiple tests. If the app structure changes, we only need to make the changes in one place. This lets us isolate our changes in our pages and not make the changes all over the place. So let's take a look at what this might look like. Our app could have different sections like the curtain, toys, bed, and desk. So with these pages, we could technically test our room. Be patient, we'll look at some real code in a second. Maybe to test these curtains, we would have code like this. Curtains put up, close, open, and take down. Now here we don't need all the gory details of what's happening inside these functions but any reader has a pretty good idea of what's going on. Even if you can't read code, the naming is pretty obvious. If your customer asked you how you could test your app, you could theoretically show them just these steps and they'd see what you were doing. You wouldn't have to give away any insider secrets, just the method names. We have a curtains object, toy object, bed object, and desk object. Page objects are just a section of your page. It could be a header, sidebar, navigation, main content, or search. Any logical area of your page will work. They can be as big or small as you find manageable. These page objects will contain selectors, public functions, private functions, and any implementation details. I suggest they should be stateless, but go with your gut. If state makes it easier, use it. It makes parallel tests harder, but you can sometimes get away with writing a bunch less code if you use state. We use our imaginations, but sometimes you want to see how real code looks. I have the code I'm going to show you in a demo in GitHub. You can see a link in the description. Go ahead and like and subscribe the video while you're down there. This pattern doesn't care about the libraries or frameworks you use to write your code. Today I'll be using Playwright and JavaScript. For the test I'm going to be running today, I'm using the Playwright test for VS Code extension which basically just gives you these uh, green arrows so that you can run your tests inside Visual Studio Code without the command line. So this is the test we're going to start off with. So in this test named basic test, what we're going to do is go to the UI testing playground, look for the text sample app and then click it. Make sure the URL says UI testing playground.com sample app. Then we're going to go to find the placeholder for username, click on it, fill out the name Jim, press the tab button, Go find the placeholder for the password, which is a bunch of asterisks. Then fill out PWD. Then we're gonna click a button that has the text of login. Finally, we'll click on the text for home. We'll double check our assertion that the URL says home. Then we'll go find the link for scroll bars. We'll click on it. We'll make sure we've made it to the scroll bars page. We'll then look for a hiding button and then click on it. Hiding button is actually hidden behind some scroll bars, but we're gonna go ahead and make sure the heading also says scroll bars when we click it, just to make sure we're on the right page. So that's a lot, but there's no page object here. It says page in the test, but let's not confuse the page object that Playwright uses, which controls our page, the URL, and other items on the page with an actual page object. So this was our first test, this basic test. And this is the same test written with page objects. And I have them both on screen here, just so you can kind of see what it looks like. But you can see here, we're gonna pull in this JavaScript object, go to the page, we're gonna click a link, we're gonna expect it to have the same URL, just like up here. Then we're gonna put in the username and password, just that same pattern we did up here. But here you can tell that we don't have any of the playwright locators, the expectations are, are still here but a lot of the locators have disappeared because those are actually in the page objects. So if we go here to look at the page object, you can see that there's not much here. This object has anything that we might use in here. It has the class that we're gonna export this home page, and we're sending that out on the exports. We have a constructor here and it takes in that page. Every time Playwright starts a new test with Playwright test, it passes a new page. So we wanna make sure we're always using that new page. Then on our go to, we're going to our website, which is always gonna be the same. And then we're passing in a link text so that we're looking for that text and then clicking on it. So we don't have to keep knowing how that works everywhere. In the logon page, it's almost exactly the same thing, the same require, a username, a password, and a login that we're using. And these are actually our locators. These are gonna be available anytime in the test. We can just call this.username to pull up that locator. And then we can click on it. You can fill in the name. You can press tab, fill the password, and click. 
This way you don't have to keep using the same placeholder repeatedly. In our first test, we repeated this placeholder three times. We could have wrote, written the test similarly where we uh, pulled this page locator out into a variable and did that. But in this case, it's just cleaner to have that existing in a class rather than in multiple different tests. So that's a good start. Page objects are doing some work for us. And let's just run this test to prove that it works. So we can see both of our tests work. Everything's going good. So this is a good start. Let's fix this up. So here we have our original test. I pulled in the second version of this page object, which we'll show you in a second. But then we have this original page object here. I took out the repetition with this version of the page object. After we click a link, we're always gonna check how that URL should look. And I'll show you how we did that in a second. But now the test is super readable. Compared to our first version where we have all this page locator stuff, we can't actually tell what we're trying to do with the test. With this page object, we can actually tell that we're, we're going to our homepage, we're gonna go log in, we're gonna log in with the user, we're gonna go back to the homepage, we're gonna go to the scroll bar page, we're gonna click on this hiding button, and then we're gonna make sure it has the text and still click on it. So we've gotten rid of some of this code that even makes it kind of hard to see what's going on with that page. So I'm just gonna comment that out here. We'll go ahead and rerun this test just to prove that it's actually working. And then we'll take a look over here at what this page object looks like. Here we can see that there's something quite different over here on this version two. We renamed homepage to navigation because that's more accurate to what's actually going on here. And we have an object that exists over in our version two that has these links. So our navigation holds a link that has a named page of login, home, and scroll bars. We have the text of what the link's gonna actually look like. And then we have the URL to the page that should navigate to when we reach that page. So we grab our page and our links when we create our object. And then when we receive a link ID, we'll check for like login up here, grab that link, which would be that whole thing. We'll then take the text off that link to look up, look up the locator and then click on it. And once we've found the link and clicked on it, we'll expect the page URL to equal whatever's up here in the URL. And then we had a special use case where if we didn't pass anything, we just wanted to go to the home page. So all we had to do was check if link ID, use the falsy value to tell us that if it's nothing, then go ahead and just go to the home page. Our other function didn't change, but it, it works just as well like this. We really didn't have to change anything else with our login, it just kind of works, which is a good sign when you're using page objects that you don't have to update everything every time. So we've done pretty good. We've cleaned up all our duplication. Someone can read this without actually knowing our code. But the problem here is we still have some variables that are hard coded, like the username and the password. So how could we clean that up? It's actually pretty easy. And I'll show you one pattern here. So to clean up this username and password, what we can do is actually use environment variables. And how you do this can be done a lot of different ways. You can be using this from a file that you're reading out of your environment. You can inject these with a container. You can do whatever you want to get these environment variables here. For right now, I'm gonna do, do this at the command line where you can see I set the environment username to Jim. I set this password here to PWD. Then we can just run this test. You can see here, then we're just gonna take the process environment username of Jim and the process environment password of PWD. And that's what's gonna be used here. So we don't have to actually commit that username and password to source control. That way any user could use this at the command line and they could use their own username and password to the repo, which would be a good idea. Otherwise you can create test users that everyone knows that are public for testing. Or like I said, you can have an external file on your disk that you read those out of. I'm not gonna demo that today, but it's an option. The other thing we did here is with every single test, you're creating a new page object here. And you're also going to the app and logging in. That's really reusable code that probably will be used by every single test, not just one test. So if you use a describe here, what you get is a before each with this BDD syntax. We're gonna log in before each, and then we're gonna verify the scroll bars, for example. So this is really the exact same test. And if we run this here with playwright test, we're gonna get our six tests with three workers. We're gonna see check marks popping up. This login verify scroll bars shows up here. This is the upper one. And this test with page two are these down here. 
So it works just the same. It's just as fast for the most part. You get the advantage of when you rewrite your tests, you can start from logged in user and not have to worry about rerunning everything yourself. And even, even here, we could clean it up more by moving this move home. We could move that home page up just because you'd rather want to start with that home page. And then you really just have these three lines for your tests. And if you want to go to another page, you can do that there as well. The one gotcha here is that the before each will grab that new page fixture that comes from Playwright. You definitely want a new page every time. If you use the page on like a before all, that won't work because the page disappears after a test runs and each page gets its own new page. So you're gonna to need to create new page objects for each. But again, these page objects can just sit there. It's not that big of a deal. It doesn't add that much time. Anything you do on the page is gonna take more time than recreating those page objects in JavaScript. I hope I helped you clean your room here. If you wanna see more Playwright, then you should check out my Playwright Masterclass. Enjoy and keep learning.